It is a pleasure to be here. I want to thank you for attending. And I look forward to the opportunity to share some of my thoughts, a little bit about where I came from, uh, about what I do here, and about what I might be doing in the future. And as a prop, I decided to bring the cover of my new book. It's called Walden's Shore. You got the subtitle from Steve. And this is a very unusual book for me because I've been slaving away on it for three or four years, and it's really not published yet. It will not be out until uh, officially published till January 6th next year and sold in stores in mid-December, but I got my preview copy just last Friday, so the excitement is real. It's a book that comes after years of work. Um, the interesting thing is that my publisher, which is Harvard University Press, doesn't, uh, isn't really sure where to classify this. They come down on literary criticism. And I think it's really odd to have a geologist and a physical scientist, a card-carrying physical scientist, um, you know, writing a book about literary criticism. The Library of Congress, when they cataloged the publication for it, uh, they decided that it was biography, or listing it principally under Henry David Thoreau. And I'm pitching it in the introduction to the edge between American studies, which are mostly the humanist interest in literature and language, and environmental studies, which is their tie to the broader environmental science that's taking place today. Uh, so that is the, the uh, uh, audience that I'm pitching, and yet I'm the kind of a guy that wrote a dissertation on the crustal structure beneath Puget Sound. Uh, and my main interests were in paleoseismicity, uh, the ancient flooding, and all kinds of other geological uh, techniques. So the story of the book as a prop is also the story of my career at UConn. And I thought I'd like to start with a little bit of background. Now, the background starts in the baby boom when I'm born in the upper Midwest in 1951 to a sodbuster Norwegian farmer's daughter and a uh, very gentle Swedish, uh, also farmer's son, uh, one generation removed. And as a kid, we just prowled around the lakes and woods and packs and fields and farms and streams, and you were not supposed to show up until dinner. And so I had one of those uh, wonderful opportunities to be, to be uh, out and about in outdoor nature, unsupervised the way children are supervised today, and in fact, the way we were required to raise our own children here in stores. Uh, the other thing that I noticed is that I became a voracious reader somewhere in the, when I left the comic book superhero stage. I went right into the Tarzan books of Edgar Rice Burroughs. And I read every single one of them, not knowing quite uh, what was to be involved with them later. And I also fell very much into Jules Verne's adventure stories, because they featured scientists. And The Mysterious Island was one that I really, really liked and read several times, and I don't know how old I was. And then, of course, I got into the Jack London books, which helped explain why I ended up in Alaska for so many years. So that brought me to uh, um, my career origin. Uh, when I can trace it to a moment. I'm living in Illinois, and I'm on a school field trip, and we're going to the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. It's just a spectacular vintage style, uh, you know, philanthropic natural history museum. And I walk in there in the entry gate, they are selling crushed dinosaur bone. It's the crushed bone that they were not able to use and piece together, 50 cents. And there went my lunch money, and there was launched my career as a geologist. And I actually created and developed and taught a course called Age of the Dinosaurs, still being taught today. I conceived it, defended it through the Senate, which is also takes some skill, uh, and then also launched the course for 12 years, uh, taught it to large audiences. So I probably have 5,000 students who've taken dinosaurs, but that's not my main area of expertise. It was just a, a curious aside that went back to that childhood moment at the Field Museum of Natural History. But I really want to talk about some of the career left turns, because if I have a message for anybody who's going to, uh, uh, a student, they, they, they get me, that, that you really don't know what's going to happen. And this is certainly the case in my career, why I'm writing a piece on literary criticism. And I'm going to start with the first one was actually a near-death experience. I was one of those uh, impetuous and daring 19-year-olds uh, uh, that just refused to follow rules. And um, I won't go into that long story, but the end result of it was my psychological recovery was picking up a copy of Henry David Thoreau's Walden, reading it carefully, as a 19-year-old might do, 
and then basically doing my best to live out by myself for a while, misinterpreting what his main endeavor really was. But that was one of the left turns, meaning that I'm still alive. The next one, and this is the oldest story in the books, I met a woman, okay? And there went the life as a bachelor, uh, dedicated, diehard, bet-making bachelor, okay, who was also an exploration geologist in Alaska, and that is indeed where I met her, all right? So I, I in a, almost an instant, I went from being an exploration geologist to being a professor. And then I had another move. This one was from Alaska, where I was having three jobs, running a volcanic ash center and an ice age research center and teaching geology and being a professor there. But my family circumstances required that I make a major move. So we sold a house, uh, left the birthright of two children, and moved to a New England, which was the only place that met my job criteria of being within an hour of the ocean, not in a city, all right, and north of the glacial border. Those were the kind of job criteria that a glacial geologist will search for. Okay, and then I just traded breadth of Alaska and the scope and the majesty for the texture and detail of New England, and it is so catchy, especially the added element of time, that I am still here and loving every minute of it. And along the way, I got fascinated by these stone walls, which I had never seen. I didn't grow up with them. They just became a curiosity to me, and I couldn't get enough of them. It's like trying to get your handicap down when you're playing golf. Uh, but instead of that, I just wanted to go get a little, another round of Stonewall watching. And the next thing you know, I published this book in 2002 after three failures with publishers. But I decided to finish the book and I published it. And um, I figured I'd just go on and carry on as I was before. A, you know, a scientist with a lab and graduate students and two or three grants funding them and keeping them busy and, uh, and being a normal research scientist. But then the book started selling and it sort of surprised me, and then it was on the list of the independent booksellers. It just sold thousands of copies in the next year or two, and uh, believe it or not, I was, uh, 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 it won the Connecticut Book Award, and I was absolutely shocked, because that's the, the, the award for nonfiction, and the year before, it was Michael Pollan for Botany of Desire, and the year after that, it was Gus Speth for uh, Red Sky at Morning, which was his view on climate change after serving 20 years in the climate change business, uh, ending at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. So I was really, really uh, taken by that. And the next thing you know, I was swept up by it, giving talks, doing this and that, and I never really got back to number crunching, data driven uh, field science. Instead, I became an essayist, then I became a columnist, and uh, one thing led to another, and I'm still at it. But in 2003, I decided to take that interest that people felt in the, uh, the students, that is, to take that interest that I thought they felt in, in American literature and American history and my developing interest in it, and through the provost's office, I won a competition to create a course called Geoscience Through American Studies. And basically what it is, is every kid coming out of high school has a good uh, English, uh, especially the ones coming to the University of Connecticut, they have a pretty good course in American English, they have a pretty good course in American history, but they have almost nothing in terms of geoscience. They don't know how the earth works. So what I tried to do is capitalize on that interest and begin teaching a course for the honors core. And it is now the oldest course created specifically for the honors uh, students here at UConn that is in their core curriculum, which is now required. Having done that, the next year, uh, a, a guy named Robert Gross shows up here, and I find out he's a history professor trying to get me to develop a, a, a theme for the first set of courses for the Honors Corps. And indeed, we did work together. We did produce one. It was called uh, 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 The Environment and Nature. And the next thing you know, we were teaching a course on Walden uh, and the American landscape with the art historian uh, and, and photographer Janet Pritchard. So the three of us began teaching this course, along with several others uh, teaching their courses. And thus, the Honors Corps curriculum was born. And when you do that, you have to keep up with your students. You have to read very, very carefully because they're reading every more carefully. So I actually read Walden for the first time very, very carefully during those years, and I just fell for it. I was completely smitten by things that I missed when I was a child and when I was a 19-year-old and when I was even in my mid-20s or my, my mid-50s when I read it. So what happened was the intellectual gravity of Walden Pond just kept drawing me back. And so I went, I published a book on the kind of lake that uh, Walden is, they're kettle lakes. And when I published that book, uh, my impression was to survey the whole galaxy of lakes from Nantucket Island all the way out to Great, Great Falls, Montana. And yet, 
much of my thought was directed to Walden and Walden Pond. It's a perfectly ordinary Kettle Lake, but not an ordinary place, given its intellectual gravity. And so one thing led to another. The next thing you know, I was working on a book. The next thing you know, my agent had a contract, and I had a new publisher, and uh, I was under deadline to write, and I wrote like a fiend, and I eventually finished this thing. And so here's the book just out last week. What I'd like to do now is, now that you know how this book came about and how it ties in with my uh, career here at UConn, I thought I would close with a quote from Thoreau in one of his uh, chapters of Walden called uh, Housewarming. And the scenario is that he's just about froze to death, and he staggered back and he made it into his, uh, into, his, uh, into his cabin, which is really a metaphorical cabin. It was actually a tidy little house. And here's what he says. When I had been exposed to the rudest blasts a long time, my whole body began to grow torpid. But when I reached the genial atmosphere of my house, I soon recovered my faculties and prolonged my life. This was a setup in Walden for his veiled discussion of the Ice Age theory of Louis Agassiz, the Swiss who came and started graduate science education at Harvard University. And here's a reading out of my book, Beyond Walden, that includes some quotes from Thoreau's Walden that describes a climate change concern they had that we do not have. Finally, Thoreau speculates on a repeat performance of the Ice Age that must inevitably return. Quote, nor need we trouble ourselves to speculate how the human race may at last be destroyed. It would be easy to cut their threads any time with a little sharper blast from the north. Here, Thoreau's words unambiguously express a common early Victorian fear, not of Armageddon, but of global refrigeration, a quote, chilling men's blood, unquote, a corollary of accepting the Ice Age theory. And of course, as you know, the main issue of our day is also climate change, but we have the opposite concern. By comparison, ours is a treat. I'm not gonna dismiss the importance of global warming, a phrase I don't even like, because it is a very serious one, but it will come on gradually, and it will require our resourceful adaptation, and it will not cause human extinction. Yet scarcely a century and a half ago, that was the main preoccupation, not just of Henry David Thoreau, but of most of his learned contemporaries as well. So we should be thankful that Earth will continue, we will continue, I will continue teaching, learning, speaking, reading, and being collegial here at UConn. It's an absolutely great place to be for me, and I thank you again for your time and attention.